Hi, welcome to our Women's Deeper Bible Study Series. My name is Karen Garces, and I'm really glad that you're able to join us today. It's been such a great journey um, through these Deeper Bible Studies. If this is your first time, welcome, and we're going to have a great time learning about the book of Acts, and right now we're in chapter 2, and it's really interesting just uh, learning about the history of the Jewish culture during the time of Acts, and it really makes the Bible come alive. So let's get started, and... Um, I'll start with a prayer. Thank you, God, so much for allowing us to know you, for your Bible that um, speaks to our hearts. And I love the book of Acts because it's really the first church that ever was started after Jesus rose from the dead. And we can learn so much as Christians from the acts of the apostles there. And I pray, God, that you speak through me. I pray that you soften our hearts and really help us to walk away different women who are ready to do acts for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's get started. Well, before we get started, I wanted to do a quick recap on Acts chapter 1. And in case you missed last week, the original book of Acts was actually combined with the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, and they were one book and it was one complete writing. And then they were broken up later during the first and second century. And it became part of the Luke became part of the gospels and um, Acts became Acts of the Apostles. And it's kind of funny because it says Acts of the Apostles. However, uh, Acts is mostly around Peter and Paul and their journey as apostles and whoever they came into contact with. And just in case you didn't know, Acts is the third longest of the New Testament writings. And the book of Acts, in uh, we learned in Acts chapter one, it begins with a movement of God's kingdom. So right before Jesus ascends to heaven, he tells his disciples, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the ends of the earth. So basically, what Jesus is telling them is that this is a spirit-filled movement, and he gives them the movement, the, the commission to be witnesses of the Holy Spirit to all the ends of the earth, starting in Acts 1. It's funny because I know for myself, I always remember the Great Commission in uh, Matthew 28, but it's also here in Acts. So let's begin in Acts chapter 2 in um, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house while they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So I want to give you a little bit of background. I highlighted the word Pentecost because a lot of us know that this incredible miracle happened at Pentecost, but a lot of us don't really know the history of the Jewish culture around Pentecost. So I'm going to give you a little bit about that. Uh, Pentecost is an ancient Israelite festival, and it encompassed all the nations of Jews, Jews from all nations, um, celebrating together, which is why at this time when Pentecost came, they were all together together. And it's the 50th day, it's called Festival of the Weeks. And it occurs seven weeks after Passover. So um, it's also known as Celebration of Spring Harvest. And for them, it would be like our Thanksgiving in November. Everyone came together and celebrated being thankful. So there's two harvests that uh, were celebrated during this time. Uh, there's an early harvest, and that early harvest was the barley harvest. And that was the harvest of the poor man. And that was, if you had a lot of money, you didn't look forward to this harvest. It was kind of, if you're poor, this is what you got. And it's also the festival of first fruits. 
And that's when the early harvest, they have a festival of first fruits during this time. And that festival of first fruits happens um, the Sunday after Passover. And I don't know if you realize the Sunday after Passover is the day Jesus resurrected from the dead. So basically the early harvest, the poor man's harvest was when Jesus resurrected from the dead. So basically Jesus is the poor man's sacrifice or known as that as well because of when it happened. Isn't that funny um, how Jesus, the son of God, who is God and deity, took the lowest of the low to be to raise from the dead. Um, and it's I know it's not a coincidence. I know it's to say that he became the lowest that he could to 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 save us all. Um, this early harvest was a, a remembrance that God brought them from the promised land. Now, there's a late harvest that also uh, Pentecost celebrates, which is um, the wheat harvest, the finer grain. And that happens 50 days after the festival of first fruits, which is the poor man's harvest. And God asks at this time all those people to offer what is best for those in need. I don't know if you guys remember uh, or have read the book of Ruth, but in the book of Ruth, she's a Moabite woman who was married to an Israelite and her husband dies and her mother who is an israel mother-in-law who is an israelite decides to go back to to the land of her ancestors so when she goes back there uh ruth she she lays down and is asked us to, uh, to to glean around um what's left over from the harvest so she actually gleaned from both the barley harvest and the wheat and the finer grain harvest but the direction for the Jews at that time was to, to be able to set aside and not pick everything. And you know what I found fascinating is that they were told to leave the best for the other people, for the poor people to glean and not take the best for themselves. And I think about that, wow, as me, as a person who follows God, who wants to be a Christian, a disciple, a follower, and honor God, um, I don't always think that way, that I want to give the best to the poor. I want to give my first uh, things uh, that, that are most important or valuable to me, and I'll get the remnants. But that's what God was creating in that tradition was to save the best for the poor who couldn't afford it. And people like Ruth, the book and Bible, she's actually in the lineage of Jesus, was able to live and survive off of that. And so um, so the uh, celebration of Pentecost, uh, Pentecost is a celebration of the harvest, the, the spring harvest, all of them together, even though they had their own festivals. And it's also a celebration of the Torah. And Torah is the giving of the law. When uh, Moses came down and gave the law, it's the story of Sinai, Mount Sinai, when uh, Moses comes down from the mountain and they believe it happened here. And the Jewish term is called Shaviat. So um, in case you're Jewish or want to know what that means. <laughs> Let's continue on to, um, to the next part of this, um, of this uh, chapter. So now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. And so here is what's going on. Uh, tongues of fire um, landing on people. And they're actually speaking languages. It wasn't gibberish. It wasn't something... 
that no one could understand. It was languages, as you see here, it was languages from Parthians and Medes and Alamites and residents of Mesopotamia, all these different places. So let's say like my husband, Gio, is um, his, he, his, uh, his family, his ancestors are from Ecuador and Nicaragua. Gio, I mean, he knows how to speak Spanish, but I'm pretty sure he has some Inca blood in him. So imagine a day like this, and then all of a sudden, Gio starts speaking fluent Inca, <laughs> which we don't know, right? Never spoke a day in his life. But the purpose would be to go back, for these people to go back and spread the message of Jesus and God's spirit to the ends of the earth, which we learned in Acts chapter 1. And the only way they can do that is to speak the languages of the people. They didn't have a written Bible. They don't have Bible apps like we do. They don't have where you can have a translator, like Google Translator or something that could translate something. They actually needed people to do that. And it was languages for a reason, the reason to help people to hear God's message and to see it. And so the people are amazed, right? And you always have a few that are the cynics. They said, hey, they had too much wine, right? So let's continue on there. It says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you carefully what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this was what was spoken, spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. They will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Don't you love how in the Old Testament it was prophesied that this would happen? You know, Prophet Joel, hundreds of years ago, wrote his book. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, or he, yeah, Prophet Joel. And then he shared... And here it's, it's true. It came out. And um, he were, it says, God will pour out his spirit on all people. So the book of Acts is about God's spirit and the movement of God's spirit throughout the world. And how, because Jesus, if you remember from the book of John, Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to die, but I'm not going to leave you alone. You will not be alone. I'm going to send my spirit, my advocate, who's going to be able to counsel you and guide you in the truth, and you will not be alone. And the spirit will help us to be able to help other people know God and to know Jesus. And so this is the book of Acts is a spirit led movement. And that's what we're going to see over and over again is God's spirit and how it Acts. And I really want to encourage us because I was out there praying this morning and I really had to confess to God because I think what I realized most for myself is that I know we're in quarantine and we're not doing a lot. Um, what do you call it? Going out and, you know, all these things, but somehow I'm still doing a lot, but not taking enough time to listen to God's spirit. And so that's what I prayed about this morning. I said, God, help me, help me to listen, take time, not just to pray, because I do pray every day. And I, I, I enjoy spending time with God. I enjoy my prayer walks with God, but really taking time to listen to God's spirit, because he does give us the spirit and to allow the spirit to guide me and really seek that. And so that's what is inspiring me as I'm studying this book of Acts right now is to listen for God's spirit, to look for God's spirit, to ask to be guided by God's spirit, because that is what Jesus had promised us. Well, the spirit will help us. Let's continue on. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. 
but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne, on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out on uh, poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So if you remember, Peter had the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's the one who's opening the doors for God's kingdom to, to start. You notice before he um, he was afraid um, of his life. <laughs> he didn't realize the spiritual fight before Jesus died. And he denied Jesus three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. And, and, and Jesus comes back and he asks, as we learned in the book of John, like, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And um, he asked him three times because he was uh, commissioning him to take care and be ready to lead the movement of God's spirit. And he also told him about how his death would be. And look at how confident Peter is now. As I read in verse 29, he says, hey, I can tell you confidently, that's not the same Peter that was in the Bible hiding. Like, I don't know the man. I don't know who he is. No. And then he calls down curses on himself. I don't know. No, he's confidently, he's confident in his relationship with God. And I want to encourage us, you know, sometimes we could get weary of ourselves when we sin against God and and feel like, oh my goodness, is God going to bless me now? I keep doing the same thing or, you know, um, but I love this story because it shows that Jesus completely forgave Peter and, and trusted him to lead his, his movement. And so I see how God forgives us, but he wants us to change and to, to be led by his spirit. And that's exactly what's going he on here. He, he explains and he shares to the people who Jesus is, that Jesus is a Christ. He is the Messiah. He's the one that is resurrected and he's exalted now to the right hand of God the Father. And then Peter also shares the promised Holy Spirit. He shares about what's happening here. The spirit that Jesus promised was going to happen is now poured on you. And this is what you see in here. And he also shares this for the Jews because David was such a huge hero and he did amazing things for God. I mean, during his time, it was known as one of the best uh, kingdoms to live under during the Israelite reign. And he's saying, uh, Peter's saying, no, David is not even close to what Jesus is. And he shares that scripture to say, hey, David is just human. And, um, and so that's what I love about this scripture here. So let's continue on. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the pre people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So Peter challenges the crowd here. And, and just so you know, the crowd, they're all Jewish. They're all Jewish people from all nations, whether there's converts to Judaism 
or of Jewish blood. They, they are there and they're in, they believe in the Jewish religion. And so he's sharing how Jesus is the Messiah and they crucified, not with their physical hands, by, but their sin. And so the people heard this and they were cut to the heart and they realized, wow, we put Jesus on the cross. What shall we do? And they were humble and teachable. Even though these Jewish people had grown up reading or listening to the, um, the Torah over and over again, uh, if there were men, they memorized it, the first five books, and that was something they did. So um, they knew God, but this is different. Jesus died for them, for their sins. And they were willing to do whatever Peter asked or shared. And Peter in verse 38 says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off. So it's very simple, repentance and baptism. You need both. You can't just get dunked in the water and that's it. You can't just repent and that's it. Peter says we need both. Both of those in the name of Jesus Christ, not in any other name, for our sins to be forgiven and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know there's a lot of different, um, what do you call it, um, philosophies of what people need to become a Christian or a disciple. This is the book of Acts. This is the beginning of God's church. This is exactly how God um, wanted it to be. This is what how the first church started. And there's other scriptures about being saved in the New Testament. You always got to see who the audience is because the other books in the New Testament are written to disciples who have already been baptized. Here, the audience at the beginning is not baptized people. And then it becomes, uh, you know, because the other books are written, like the Corinthian book is written to baptize the Corinthian church. Things like that. The book Ephesians was written to the, the Ephesian church. So those people have already been baptized and repented. And so we have to take, as we read the Bible and be careful to take it in context context because there's certain things especially with salvation that we really need to make sure we have on right <laughs> and so also so we can teach others because um it can be very confusing i i listened to a, a person who uh, who's a preacher online who i've received many great theological studies from him However, he tears up this passage into a way and he adds more to explain to it that's not in the Bible. So we really got to be careful about this because there's traditions that even some theologians are not willing to give up. And we just have to make sure that we're right reading what we see here and what it is. So let's continue on. It says, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So there, it, notice it said those who accepted his message were baptized. Not everyone accepted the message, but 3,000 were added to their number. And what I love about verse 42 to 47, it really shares the, the thankfulness that the disciples had for one another, for their salvation and for God. They devoted themselves. Another word is addicted. They, were, they couldn't get enough of being around each other to, and to learn about God's teaching. I think for us to like, I'm glad we're doing this class, but it, what would be really cool is like, maybe you can start in your, on your own, like a little, maybe with what's even been taught here in the past ones on the YouTube and maybe do a watch thing on zoom or something with a neighbor, a friend and, and talk about it or, or with other sisters and do it just one with another sister and, and talk about it so we can learn more together um, about having a closer relationship with God. So they, they fellowshiped, they broke bread together, they ate together, they prayed together. And I know during this time, it can be very hard to do that, but we have to make time. Even if we can't physically meet together, 
we can call each other and pray. We can FaceTime each other and pray. We could do a lot of different things, text each other. We could say text prayers. I've texted prayers before <laughs> and different things. There's so many different ways we could pray now. It's really neat. And what I love about this is all the believers were together and had everything in common. Remember I shared about um, Ruth and the gleaning, um, how um, in that festival where um, the wheat festival where they're um, or the the first festival, the uh, harvest, and the second, um, they left a lot of the, uh, what do you call it, the best of their crop for the poor people to get. And an analogy from there of what the Israelites did is what's happening here in Acts. It's a complete parallel. They sold their possessions and good and gave to anyone as he had need. That's exactly what was happening in their festivals that they were celebrating. So this Pentecost from the Jewish tradition connected the, um, connected the tradition that they had from the Jewish celebration of Pentecost. And, um, and they did exactly the same, not just left. So them not leaving the physical crop that of the best they gave and sold their things to meet the needs. And that's exactly the same of what was going on in the celebration of Pentecost. So this is a true Pentecost and a celebration of giving. And, um, and I love how, because of that, they, God kept adding to their number daily and as I read this, uh, this really challenges my sinful and comfortable nature because I like, you know, to buy things for my home or um, have, whether it's plants or, you know, um, a thing that will like work better in the bathroom for the kids and all the stuff that they have to wash themselves with, you know, whatever it is, you know, I, I like to, to take care of what or make better what I have, but I really don't continually seek who can I help? Who in our church really can use help? What single mom could I really like encourage this Christmas? Maybe get them their kids presents that they can't afford, but we could help or, you know, or, or some neighbor who can use something or whatever it be, you know, um, how can we be like the disciples here to really uh, honor God and um, give to each other. And you notice that they were completely united. It says in verse 44, that all the believers were together and had everything in common. They had everything in common because their purpose about Jesus and uh, taking care of each other. And I, I really want to call us back to that because I think we could get caught up because of the being on lockdown for us, um, if you live in other states, it might not be the same, but for us, it, we're locked down and we're, we're not supposed to meet with people and all these different things right now. But we can still encourage people. We can still leave gifts. We can still, um, you know, maybe six feet apart, <laughs> do something, you know, with masks and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, it, this really challenges me here. But I see how happy the disciples were and God kept adding because this is so different from the world. If we look at our world today, a lot of people don't, even in churches, don't really know what's going on in each other's lives and they're hurting and they're feeling alone. And here, because everyone was together spiritually and physically and um, they sacrificed for each other, they were completely unified. And if we can imitate that, we'll definitely, people in the world who aren't disciples will see that and want that. And so um, that's something that I see here. I wanted to share with you because there are similarities between Moses at Mount Sinai and Pentecost on, in Acts. So in, you know, when Moses goes to uh, Mount Sinai, he goes to get the Ten Commandments. And so he gets the Ten Commandments and he comes 
God actually has to tell him to come down from the temple or from the mountain because the people have made a golden calf and they started to worship it because Moses took too long at the temple. So here in Pentecost, uh, you'll see, even though they weren't on a physical mountain of the Lord, Mount Zion has always been uh, predicted in the, in the Old Testament, like in, in I, um, Isaiah, um, where it uh, talks about all people streaming. And that's actually Isaiah chapter two, one through four, if you want to look there. But it talks about Mount Zion. And that's where it begins here. And so both people from Moses at Mount Sinai and Pentecost in Acts, they come to the mountain of the Lord. Now the word glossa is used in both Mount Sinai and Pentecost. And if you want to look at this, this is actually in Exodus chapter 32. You can read it um, further. But there's thunder that comes down. And the same word in Pentecost is used, but for tongues of fire. Um, in Mount Sinai, God is going to build a temple, which is a tabernacle for them. In Acts of Pentecost, uh, or in Pentecost, in the book of Acts, God is going to build a temple with God's people. It's actually a living temple. <laughs> God's fire in Mount Sinai consumes the tabernacle in pentecost in acts god's fire comes down and settles on some and takes residence in the new temple which is the people in mount sinai three thousand people something happened to them so i'm going to share with you what happened there and um Exodus 32, verse 27 and 28. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, killing each brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day, about 3000 of the people died. So you see here. In Acts 32, when the people were worshiping the, um, the golden calf, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, <laughs> uh, Moses, he, he calls people to, well, first of all, he melts the calf and then he makes the, everyone drink it <laughs> with water. And um, then he asks who's on his side uh, and all the Levites actually come to his side and the rest um uh, the 3000 were put to the sword because they chose not to follow god and um when you see pentecost here it, on acts 241 mind you these are all jewish people they're from all nations but they're all jews and it says those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3000 were added to their number that day Pentecost in the book of Acts is a story, a, a restoration story for what happened in Exodus. You know, 3,000 people died a brutal death because they were, they're Israelites. God had just rescued them from um, the Egyptians. And then uh, Moses goes to Mount Sinai and then comes down and they're already worshiping an idol. And so that's what happened there. But God, I love how God has a redemption story here. He's like, I did not forget my people. There, this is not coincidental. 3,000 were added to their number that day. So let's continue on in that list. I think that's what it is. Um, so you can look at this. Um, yeah, that was the end of what happened. Peter uh, addresses the crowd and 3,000 were added to God's kingdom by baptism. So if you want, you can take a screenshot or I could say, send it to you too. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's it for my Acts chapter two. I hope it was inspiring. I know my, I was completely inspired by just the, the relevance of the Old Testament in the book of Acts and how the whole Bible goes together and the, also the disciples and their unity and they're taking care of people and giving more the best 
to others and not for themselves. I'm going to close out here. Uh, thank you for joining. And we're going to have for the people here today on Zoom, we're going to have a discussion right now.